Hey listener, this week we're talking about a property that has some issues, so it's going to bring up topics such as racism, transphobia, elements of catfishing, online stalking, and online harassment, as well as some pretty rampant misogyny. If those aren't things you feel like hearing about, that's totally fine. Not the episode for you. If you're sticking around, please enjoy the episode that's about to follow. But to anyone and everyone listening, thank you so much for listening and supporting our podcast regardless. Hope you have a wonderful day. Let's get started. Hi, welcome to Author's Note. Don't like, don't listen. My name is Cass. And my name's Tease. Tease, how are you doing this week? Oh my god, Cass. This episode we've been cultivating has like taken a toll on me mentally and yeah. um I feel like it's been affecting my week. <laughs> but <laughs> my eyes hurt, my brain hurts. Yeah, now that it's done, like now that we're talking about it here though, I feel good. How how do mm-hmm. you feel? How are you feeling? Um I had a persistent headache all of yesterday oh, no. as I worked through the second part, which only seemed fitting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, before we get into that, though, uh-huh. have you watched or read or partaken in anything fun this week? Besides other this than our awful... <laughs> other than our cursed material, yeah. which we'll reveal if you haven't been following <laughs> soon enough. So, this past Thursday... Oh, no. I played Fallout New Vegas for the first time. Yes! Oh, it was so good. <laughs> it was so wonderful. Um, I've been streaming on Thursdays from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if you guys would like to join in. Uh, Twitch.tv slash T-City. Yep. Always be plugging. That's me. Um, I, I've never played a Fallout game before. Actually, that's a lie. I played Fallout 4 for like 10 minutes and I was like, this is bad. I just stopped. But well, you've never played a video game before. That is true as well. Actually, yeah, yeah. I played Mario Kart today. Thank you very wow. much. Wow. I know. Big gamer moment. Tease uh, become true gamer. I, I, I am now. Um, <laughs> but as if my 200 hours plus of Tetris 99 has not spoken for anything. But I played New Vegas for the first time. It took me 90 minutes to complete the tutorial. It was so fucking <laughs> funny. <laughs> I didn't know that you didn't have to sit from your canteen. You did it automatically. It was just atmospheric. Every every time the pop up came up that says you take a uh, sip from your trusty canteen, Tease would go time for a sip, and everyone in the chat would start screaming. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It truly felt like Twitch plays Tease plays Fallout New Vegas. That's really how I felt too. It was. It was a great time. I hope, I hope I get better as it as time goes along, and Mister Stinky Jotham continues to <laughs> succeed in his little quest. Hopefully, you won't keep killing coyotes and dogs. I didn't know you weren't supposed to kill the coyote. <laughs> you are. They're a hostile. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> it's okay to kill the coyotes. We were just questioning why you kept shooting at them when they were like halfway across the map. <laughs> Okay, well, what about you? Did you consume anything? Um, yeah, I watched Godzilla King of the Monsters, mm-hmm. and then I watched Kong Skull Island. Uh, do we also want to mention what happened in the realm of the podcast this past week as well? Oh, yes. So, unfortunately... <laughs> Thank you to a, an incredibly generous person who donated $50 to our coffee. I will at some point, probably this week or next, be reading all of the Cullen address transcript and bringing it down point by point. I'll put a poll up on the Twitter for how people want me to format that and how you want me to go about it. If you want me to like read it and then comment or like read the whole thing and then separate out the commentary afterward. Uh, but yeah. Tease, I got a really important question for you. Yeah, what's up? Uh, team Kong or Team Goji? I feel like I gotta be Goji. Yeah. Because I'm a... I love Mothra. She's my girlfriend. Mm-hmm. And uh, the girlfriend of my girlfriend is my girlfriend. 
So <laughs> when you enter into a polycule, <laughs> me, Godzilla, and Mothra are in a polycule together. <laughs> what about you? I, Do you, are you Team Kong or Team Goji? Goji, mm. I I love Kong. I do. Monkey. <laughs> he's not a monkey. He's an ape. <laughs> he's monkey. Stop. <laughs> Skull <laughs> Island was like way better than I expected it See? to be, though. I haven't seen Skull Island, but I have a handful of friends who really are on the like Skull Island hype train. So when you told me that you were gonna watch it, I was like, oh, I hope it's actually good. Cast, tell me if it's good. There's, there's, there's definitely some parts where you're like, oh, okay, but like it's gen, it genuinely has like good cinematography, and I was like, there are a lot of centered shots in this. Why? And then I realized like there's a big conflict that like totally showed me why because it was a 3D movie. Aww. So there's, there's like one scene that's like. I think it's just me uh, <laughs> that was not super fun to look at because I could tell that it was like made for 3D and I was a little like oh, okay uh. but like the acting is good and like it's really not- they also don't make Tom Hiddleston and Brie Larson kiss which I was so Thank thankful for God, oh my god but it, it was like it's it, like the colors are really beautiful the monster design is like fantastic it's just mm delicious Tasty. you know it has it has issues but it's mm-hmm. a fun movie like okay. it's a good fun popcorn movie unlike king walk. of the monsters which is kind of stinky but i'm just there to look at the monsters it was kind of stinky i must say millie bobby brown is like the best part of the movie i wish they would just like kick her parents aside complete i don't care about them i don't <laughs> i care about the little girl who wants to protect the monsters she knows what's up I kind of spent the whole entire movie pointing at the screen when another kaiju would come on. I actually saw it in theaters, and um, I I saw it with one of my good pals, my pal John. Friend of the show. <laughs> Love him dearly. I, I Never met him, but I trust him with my life. I don't think it was opening weekend. I think it was $5 Tuesday opening, dare I say. So, Worth it, yeah. Yeah, so... um. Everybody in the theater was pretty excited when the monsters came out, and that's what I like to see. I love to see some sexy monster designs. You know, the fun thing is that our topic this week will allow us to touch on Godzilla again. Yeah. Unfortunately. If this piece of media was real, what world would we want to be real on it? Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you have a... So, hi guys, we're going to talk about Ready Player One. Yay! Yay! Um, but Cass, if the Oasis was real, do you have any world you would like to see in the Oasis? I thought about this quite a bit. Uh Uh-huh. And I feel like the obvious answer that people would expect would be like, okay, Cass wants to be in the Muppets, which like, yeah, sure. That would be fun. I'm pretty sure that it exists or it's mentioned somewhere. Of course it exists. Everything exists in the Oasis. I think I would really like to pilot an LFO. From Etika Seven, taste, and I want to know what it is like to ride on trap bar waves. I want to surf in the air. I think that's a really good answer. I feel like that would just be so magical, and yeah. I love the colors and aesthetic of Etika Seven. Yes. So it's just that I, would be one of the many things I would wish to enjoy. What about you, Tees? I've watched like the first six episodes. I actually still am slowly going back and watching an episode like once in a while. So I am Tasty. getting through it. Getting through it. Um. I feel like the obvious answer for me is Neopet as a whole. Neo- so would you, okay, if Neopet were, you know, in Oasis, would you want to be a Neopet or would you want to be like a person exploring the world of Neopets? I think I want to be a person exploring the world of Neopets. Interesting. Dare I say the land of Neopia, because there is a lot to debate about whether or not you play as a human who takes care of your Neopets. Or if you mm-hmm. are a Neopet, um, mm. it's never been fully confirmed which one you are. So I think I might want to just be my avatar and hang out with my Neopets. Because, for instance, my grape, incredibly tiny. <laughs> and I don't want to squish any grapes. You know? <laughs> but Pop them in your mouth. No, I would never <laughs> pop her in my mouth. <laughs> she is my grape. <laughs> Um, Devour. Eat the grape. <laughs> Please don't. Um, Squimsh. <laughs> no. <laughs> I 
also feel like that I could kiss a fairy if I was a human and not a Neo pet. <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of things, but also, I hated the Sailor Moon world, and yet, I wish I could. I wish I. Well, could. you could you could be like a Sailor Scout in another universe. Yeah, I could. which is cool. That is fun. Maybe I don't know. I guess Neopets is my answer. I guess Neopia mm. is what it would be. I mean, I guess like you could be Scrunt too. I could be. Oh my god, I could be Scrunt too. <laughs> what if? What if there was a? You know, remember how like when old Furbies like first came out, there was like Furby lore that they came from like that planet with the clouds and all the clouds yeah. were like purple and green. What if Furby Land was real? Well, it probably is. Would we live there? Mm. Would you take Cadbury Larry David? Okay, his Lee. name is Cadbury Larry David Hair Twisted Face Lore. <laughs> <laughs> Please address him only by his full name. <laughs> Apologies, sir. We're talking about Ready Player One this week, and we're talking about Ready Player One because I think it's, well, we both think it's pretty emblematic of, like, the very clear divide in the different sorts of fandom that there are. Yes. And also, Ready Player One is, like, for anyone who's not familiar with fandom, I think it is the touchstone they go to when they have, like, a nerdy child, and they're like, have you read this book, son? <laughs> Actually, 100% <laughs> Which yes, because... It's so deeply unfortunate. <laughs> uh-huh. I, I have a step-sibling, and he was like, I really liked Ready Player One. I know you're kind of geeky. Have you read it? I was like, no. But here's my copy of Scott Pilgrim on a USB. And I just handed it over to him. It's like, Be better. Yeah. And like Scott Pilgrim, by all means, has its own issues. But like, I think part of the reason Scott Pilgrim was written was to talk about why, like, why are geek men so fucking freaky? And yeah. with Ready Player One, it rewards you for being a fucking weirdo. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> I don't know if I want to put it like that. I, I mean, Wade sucks. <laughs> like... Wade sucks. Uh, for anyone who is unfamiliar with Ready Player One, I'm going to just read the description Please on the do. back of the book to you. I'm filled with so much rage that like it didn't even cross my mind to tell people what Ready Player yeah. One was. <laughs> In the year 2044, reality is an ugly place. The only time teenage Wade Watts really feels alive is when he's jacked into the virtual utopia known as the Oasis. Wade's devoted his life to studying the puzzles hidden within the world's digital confines, puzzles that are based on their creator's obsession with the pop culture of decades past, and that promise massive power and fortune to whoever can unlock them. But when Wade stumbles upon the first clue, he finds himself beset by players willing to kill to take this ultimate prize. The race is on, and if Wade's going to survive, he'll have to win and confront the real world he's always been so desperate to escape. First of all, I don't think that is an accurate description of this book. And second of all, that description makes this book sound way more interesting than it actually is. <laughs> yeah. It was written by Ernest Klein and it was released in 2011. Yes. Yeah. This book is stinky. We read, so we read this book and then we read the sequel, which came out this year. And we also watched the movie, which neither of us had to do. And we weren't even going to read the sequel originally, but we needed to know. Or rather, Tease needed to know. And then I felt bad that Tease was reading the sequel. So I also read the sequel. Sometimes <laughs> I just purposely make myself burn to feel something. <laughs> Clearly. I. Oh, Jesus Christ. I mean, the best way to really describe it is a kid who's too good at fucking trivia, 80s trivia accidentally becomes the ceo of a giant game right and that's it so the the whole premise is that you have this creator who came up with the oasis which is a virtual reality world that has now licensed pretty much every property in the world and is a giant mega corporation itself and is used like by everyone and has overlap with the real world so that like if you go to an arcade in the oasis and order a pizza a pizza can show up to you in real life right and the creator dies and he sets up his will so that whoever can solve these little riddles which are like in incredibly niche and just obscure and oblique will then get to inherit the entirety of the oasis and Not to mention 
all of these riddles are based off of his diary, essentially. His, the, <laughs> it's called Anorax Almanac, and it is literally formatted like the Bible. You have, like, chapter such, verse such. <laughs> and it, it Klein is so... quotes it. Yeah, Klein quotes it in the book, and it's cited like the Bible mm-hmm. verse. Which has its own issues, and I think we can talk about the first book and then move into the second yeah, book. Yeah, that sounds good. The there's so much this book has so much of a lack of awareness of what it's <laughs> what it's like setting out as a plot premise. So like a lot of people like Wade, who is our main character who narrates the book, are motivated to get the Easter egg and claim possession over the Oasis because they don't want another company called IOY, which is posed as like this CD other mega corporation to have possession of it because then ioi will start charging exorbitant rates for it and make it inaccessible and at one point wade describes that company as fascist and it's like wait 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 (laughs) hold on gregarious games who made the oasis has dominion and licensure over like every existing property that ever has been is literally in everybody's homes monitoring them constantly And it had a billionaire CEO who hoarded all of his wealth and is giving it away at random based on people knowing about his personal life. And you have a problem with IOI? (laughs) To put it in normie terms, it's like as if Tesla was trying to buy Disney. Like, or or it's like Amazon v Disney. It's just, it's ridiculous. It's just, it's not like how They're they're both evil. They're both evil. Oh my god, this book makes me so mad. Like, I'm just, I'm steaming like a vegetable right now just thinking about this. <laughs> From a totally technical standpoint, these books aren't very well written. No. They, the, the really confusing thing about these books is that they are, so they're marketed towards adults. Because adults are the only people who are going to understand all of the 80s uh, references. Mm-hmm. And when I said say all of the 80s references, I mean that quite literally... Every other sentence of this book is a reference. Yes, 100%. And then the sentence that follows that reference is a sentence explaining that reference to the reader, Mm -hmm. which is so obnoxious and so annoying. But the the way like sentences are structured and the word choice is incredibly simplistic. And it's like, it's really meant for like, in terms of a reading level... 11 year olds can handle this easily it feels like a middle school level book honestly Mm -hmm. it's it feels like young reader not even young adult but then it's so laden with like swears and really like crass childish innuendo as well there's so much gross humor and not like not like appropriate for kid crass humor just like sexual jokes and like talking about masturbation yeah it's really horny and there's even so horny there's like so many soliloquies and monologues about like beating your meat and whatever and i'm just like oh shut up and like my mom always talks about how books like some like i know books reading books is a gender neutral thing however it's very obvious when books are geared towards men versus books that are geared towards women yeah and this book is like geared towards men in their late 30s early 40s who clearly don't read but have deep nostalgia for the time that they were Mm -hmm. children and ready player one is designed for those people Mm -hmm. and because ernest klein is that person but what baffles me is that ernest klein like was a hobbyist writer and writes poetry a lot and like if this is your hobby it shouldn't be your day job baby like well, now it is because this book sold incredibly well. And I think it sold incredibly well because it it latched onto the nostalgia so many people had. But like when you get right down to the nitty gritty, like this this book is not good. Wade has no character development whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, Wade as a main character fucking sucks. He's just obnoxious and he's rude and he's condescending. The entire tone of the book is incredibly arrogant and mm-hmm. 
I felt like the entire book was mansplaining to me. It it literally it felt, really felt like, it. like going into a comic book store and like dealing with some dude who didn't even work there, like following me around and telling me about everything I looked at that I already knew about. It's so bad. It's so bad. And Wade is like totally a Mary Sue as well. Which wouldn't bother me yeah. if he wasn't a dick. <laughs> yes. And like, for instance, Wade is literally named Wade Watts because his dad thought it was a superhero name. And Mm -hmm. that beefs me so bad because if this was like any other series, people would be like, this is dumb as hell. Like, why would you name your child that on purpose? Like, do you really want to be the main character of the day or something like that? And in turn, he is the main character of the day because he's the main character of the fucking book. (laughs) I actually, I don't personally mind like the Wade Watts thing. I think that's actually kind of charming Mm -hmm. and like. I would have rather seen that sort of thing built upon because everything in this book around Wade is a hundred times more interesting than he is. And this isn't even like, it's not even that Wade lacks characterization so that the reader can put themselves in his place. It's that Wade is clearly the self insert for Ernest Klein in all of the worst ways. Yes. It's, You know how when people play video games and because nobody can see their face, they're a dick. Wade is the embodiment of that character, of that person. Oh, you mean when they're, like, playing online? Yeah. Like, yeah. when people are mean and, like, teabag you after they kill you or whatever, and <laughs> they leave you, like, shitty notes and live because, like, oh, you suck. Like, Wade is so weird, and the way that Klein writes women and the way that Wade treats women is so disrespectful and i think that really speaks volumes to how uh klein views women within nerdy situations Mm -hmm. and he like this man is really boldly writing about basically souped up vr chat and clearly has never been on vr chat in his life (laughs) like he talks about how if you were on vr like if you're in the oasis which is basically vr chat women only look like either like weird fetish characters or like porn stars and there's like no in between and the reason why the like token girl character of the series exists wade has a crush on her because she's quote-unquote rubenesque like ernest klein literally cannot say the goddamn word like fat or chubby to save his life like if you don't know what he can say it about wade (laughs) but he won't say it about a woman yeah so and like it baffles me because Artemis is, like, obsessed with saving the world and making sure people are, like, Artemis fed. is a good human being. Artemis and is a Wade good human sucks. being. <laughs> and, and Wade sucks. And I just, it baffles me that Klein puts all of the quote-unquote good characteristics of a person on Artemis and not on Wade. So, like, it almost feels like some weird-ass manic pixie dream girl situation. Like... Because well, I mean, it absolutely is. Yeah, because she's so perfect. Wade puts her on a pedestal and has a crush on her for years. Mm-hmm. And then... Wade is victim to a parasocial... Or rather, I should say Artemis is the victim of a parasocial relationship that Wade forms with her. She is. By reading her blog. Literally. And he saves all of her screenshots that she takes. Every it, it is a... It's a really uncomfortable situation, and I think it it definitely lacks awareness, right? Because, like, this is a real situation that happens to Twitch streamers where Mm -hmm. there are people who think they know them and develop these crushes on them and then approach them in-game and, like, will try to blackmail them or, like, hold information up over their head. And it just, it creates a really uncomfortable situation in the best of circumstances. Mm -hmm. And obviously, right, this is a fictional book. Things can go differently. Things can change. But... Mm -hmm. There is, Wade as a main character is so much the embodiment of, like, the nice guy who thinks he's, you know, like, discriminated against because he's a nerd. And there's even a a bully character in the story who, like, harasses him. And Wade is a dick to him when he makes comebacks. And it's like, you're no better than he is. Mm -hmm. You literally think you are a better human being than him because you have all this random 80s knowledge. Like... It's just obnoxious. Yeah, his name is Irock, and I, I love <laughs> Irock. I respect Irock deeply, but I I'm obsessed with the fact that Irock calls him Penisville, <laughs> and 
people. Iraq is an icon. <laughs> <laughs> in this house, I feel like we would be Iraq in this situation. Because he calls him Penisville because Wade's character and screen name in the Oasis is Parzival. <sighs> Parzival There's is so a much. There's so much. <laughs> It's so bad. I, I will say the one moment I did really enjoy in the book was Parzival Wade has a best friend in the Oasis named H. And H is like this big, beefy dude who is doing like PvP zones. He's in Coliseums all the time. He's like super strong and like really bro y. There are some issues with his writing, but when Wade meets H's player in the real world, She's a butch lesbian, yeah, and I think boy. that's great. She's a black butch lesbian, and she's phenomenal. Except uh, Ernest Klein doesn't know how to write people of color to save his life, mm. and so has her dropping, like, both Spanglish and also just, like, she's constantly saying, like, dude, bruh, fam, and it's like, oh, yeah, buddy. <laughs> it's... The oh. Japanese characters oh then too. So uh. there are two Japanese characters and their their names are Shoto and Daito. And one of them is killed in real life by IOI, the evil mega corporation. And when Wade is asking the other character, you know, maybe did he actually commit suicide? He goes, No, he would never commit seppuku. And it's like, oh my god. Ernest Klein. You can't do that. Seppuku is not generalized suicide. The Japanese characters are also always saying like Wade San, Parzival San, Arigato. And it's just, it's so, it's so uncomfortable. Bad. It's so bad. <laughs> Especially when there is a, like, it is established that there is a built in translator in the Oasis. So I don't know why the San honorific would carry over it's or like... why Arigato would not just change to thank you. <laughs> it's just so Ernest Klein can be a, a, make a stereotype. According to Kikaku, Kikaku means plan. Like Stop. Oh, my God. <laughs> and I read a quote from this that drove me insane. Yeah, please do. So there's a so Wade Parzival does this weird thing where he kind of talks to the audience at the same time as basically writing a fucking diary like is does klein think that this is wade's own almanac or whatever i don't even know but anyway to quote ready player one basically kid what this all means is that life is a lot tougher than it used to be in the good old days back before you were born things used to be awesome but now they're kind of terrifying to be honest the future doesn't look too bright you were born in a pretty crappy time in history and it looks like things are only going to get worse from here on out human civilization is in decline some people say it's even collapsing and this really set me on fire very deeply for so many reasons because one this is set in the like this is supposed to be glorifying the 80s and for everybody who wasn't a white cis straight man the Reagan eras in particular hurt and damaged so many minority groups in so many different mm -hmm. ways. I mean, the AIDS epidemic, the war on drugs, XYZ, like the 80s is in no way, shape or form any better than the 70s, the 90s, the early aughts today. The good old days the, are an illusion. Yeah, there's no such thing as the good old days. You only feel like this decade is the best because you have nostalgia mm -hmm. and you probably grow up during it there's um we always tend to view stuff in a certain way and because you were children there's no way for you to realize what was going on when you were a child besides small glimpses of that however mm -hmm. it's your duty to kind of reflect on that as you get older and uh, clearly Ernest Klein never has he's continued to like live this obsession and this fantasy and what's wild is that there's like this whole concept that quite literally the world is collapsing but it is it is so poorly developed like, yeah you get very little idea of what the world is actually mm -hmm. like outside of the oasis yeah everything in this book is over explained it is a everything is told to you nothing is shown at no point are you ever allowed to like sit there and maybe think on the riddle yourself every point by point by point everything is being explained to you and told to you mm -hmm. so at no point do you even get like the satisfaction of like trying to solve the mystery alongside wade they're quite literally the book frequently does this thing where it goes 
it, it'll set up a conflict and then Wade will go, of course I had, and then begin to describe a situation where he had like planned for this contingency, mm-hmm. you know, like weeks in advance, but we never saw any of that. So none of those moments where he overcomes anything are actually satisfying. Mm-hmm. He just happens to like seem to solve them right there yeah. as they present themselves, which is so infuriating. But we get told maybe like once or twice about the fact that like the world is collapsing. We used up all the fossil fuels. But then at the same time, Columbus, Ohio, which is the hub, has fully established solar energy arrays to like power the entirety of the city. And like they they keep talking about, you know, like world pandemics and famine and hunger. And it's like Ernest Klein really really doesn't do any work in this book Mm -hmm. there there is a certain skill to being able to write a story from point a to point b and tie it all off Mm -hmm. but everything in this book is carried by the references Mm -hmm. you won't get even proper descriptions of rooms because instead ernest klein will just describe to you a room that appeared in a john hughes movie point by point And it's like, okay, but you didn't establish that scene. You didn't come up with it. You're literally just describing a picture to me, but in the blandest way possible. Mm -hmm. And so you keep hearing about how the world is like totally awful and there are criminals everywhere, but you don't get a sense of how that happened, why that happened, or how that's actually affecting anyone. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it's, if you haven't seen these movies or read these books or played these games there's like an automatic out like you're gonna be othered within this world and that's no way to welcome somebody who's reading this this book is gatekeeping me it 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 really does though it It really does though like Like, i'm not kidding sometimes for instance there's a one of the clues he's forced to do something in relation to russia's 2112 and I've never listened to it, but it's like, fuck it. Like, I could listen to it while I read it, I guess. And I was like, why do we still like music from the 80s? <laughs> like, why am I forcing myself to listen to Rush 2112 when Ernest Klein could be the one who's listening to Britney Spears' is Toxic and it would be mm-hmm. 10 times more entertaining? And I think what also really rubs me the wrong way about this series is that The world has continued to move forward in pop culture and in media. And yet, because this man was obsessed with the 80s, time never moves another day forward. Yeah, there's no there's no references to like 90s, early aughts, anything like that. There's there's not even mention of like futuristic properties, which have become really popular. There's a whole segment of the book where Wade talks about how going through one of the challenges of the whole game is literally just watching war games, but you're in the seat of the the narrator. You are the war games. The main character. And you're just reciting line by line what happens through war games. That's literally a whole segment of the book. Yeah. And I think what really frustrates me is that Klein's view of pop culture affected how he made these characters there has always been an issue with the way sci-fi properties and cyberpunk properties treat asian culture Mm -hmm. and i say asian culture because they treat it as a megalith that they that is just like a big pot with no discernible differences which is really disgustingly Mm -hmm. frustrating and and racist also there's such a huge push for people online and geeks and nerds in particular not to view japan as only as this weeaboo mecca and yet ernest klein only mentions stuff about japan in relation to its pop culture and a very niche part of its pop culture too like one of them is considered like a sega expert they know they've seen every ultraman episode they uh know shit about neon genesis evangelion like all this stuff and, like, yeah, that's cool and all. Like, congrats, Ernest Klein, you've watched this, but what's stopping you from talking about a Mish- Mishima life in four chapters? Like, you know? it's It all feels like a very surface level understanding Mm -hmm. and and that's that's kind of the weird thing about this book right is that Mm -hmm. it has so much like deep cuts 
but it also fails to make me interested in those properties because at no point does Ernest Klein stop to like really evoke any feeling or emotion from me mm-hmm. in regard to any of these properties and the the movie tries the movie does a fantastic job of actually making Wade somewhat likable yeah. because they basically change the entire plot of the movie mm-hmm. I mean of the book in the movie and so the the movie is like a weird in between point between the two books and part of me wonders if that in working on the screenplay for the movie Ernest Klein didn't get the idea for the second book because it feels like the step between them it's like one and 1.5 and then two you know what I yeah. mean so the the movie hinges a lot more on a character named Kira who the creator of the Oasis was in love with but who his co-creator and best friend ended up marrying and there's there's so much like the way Ernest Klein treats the women in this book is really just a series of like pieces to move the story forward but not to really develop they are there to serve the men in the story in a yes. really obnoxious and annoying way like yeah. artemis who is opposite of wade is like a genuinely good person and when she's like hey wade if you win what are you gonna do with the money he's like oh i want to get like a big mansion a bunch of cars i want to go into and then a i'll build a spaceship and, and put all my friends on it and we'll <laughs> fly to find a new habitable planet and she's like hey what the fuck you should use that money like i'm gonna use that money to save the world we're on right now to make sure people have food and housing and shelter and he's like nope big spaceship and why the fuck didn't Hol- james holiday the original owner of these billions of dollars not do right. that either right and and so you spend the entire first book lionizing halliday and how amazing he is and how incredible he is even though it's like it's very clear that Halliday himself is a dick and part of me thinks that Ernest Klein saw reception to the first book and went oh shit I didn't mean for him to be a dick and then in the second book was like okay now I need to I need people to know that I realize he was a dick too and it's like Halliday is also corrupt Halliday also hoarded billions of dollars Halliday made the way to get gaining his fortune and property of the oasis the most narcissistic possible thing he could it's all about him it's all about his life experiences and so the the end of the book tries to remedy this by like having them work together but again Wade never grows as a character. Wade never changes. Wade never develops. And that's 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 book one and two. Between the two books, Wade doesn't change. You know He's what a happens? dick the entire time. Dear listeners, do you know what happens in book two? Oh god, book two is book two is awful. Wade and Artemis bone for a week straight. They get together for a week. And then he says something really awful to her and she breaks up with him and then he pines for her for three years. He does not get over his internet girlfriend that he dated for a week for three years. The So the weird part too, right, is that the movie, the movie makes this story super accelerated when the first book takes place over multiple years, Mm -hmm. many, many Mm -hmm. years. I didn't realize that it was going to take place over many years. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is weird. And then the movie happened. I was like, this is happening really fast. Like, the movie moves hysterically fast. And I I don't know how you make a giant robot fight boring, Ernest Cline, but you sure did it. Oh, wait, I know exactly how you make a giant robot fight boring. You go, Mechagodzilla did that thing from that movie in such and such year. And then the Ava unit did this thing from this episode of NGE from this year. That's how you make it boring. You Avas don't are actually not describe big. what's happening They're tiny. To me. They're tiny and they're plugged into little cords and they can't yeah. move far. And the Sir, Iron not how Giant does not work. use a gun. That's the whole point of the Iron Giant. Oh my god, this whole episode is just me having a breakdown on recording. I'm so sorry. But and and so, so but, but okay, so here's the thing, right? Is like there are two sects of like let's call it nerddom and mm-hmm. fan fandom, right? Mm-hmm. Is that you have two opposites where there are people who like to engage with media, create fan fiction, 
create fan art, all sorts of stuff, and like really understand the nuance of characters, what makes them successful, why they're so interesting. And then you have the part of fandom that predicates itself upon just knowing information. Mm -hmm. And the more information you have, the more of a legitimate fan you are. Oh my God, that's so boring. Like if that makes you feel fulfilled, whatever. But if you're coming to me at conventions and explaining to me something that I've drawn fan art of, I, one, don't want to hear it. And two, literally couldn't give a shit. Because to me, it's not necessarily about, like, the random facts and errata from the source material. Like, yeah, they're cool to learn. But, like, that's not the fun part of the experience for me. And this book is all just, I know this information. I don't actually care about any of the characters in it or, like, what made them so evocative or what made them so successful. Like, dude... You have an enormous wealth of knowledge of 80s properties and very little understanding of why any of those properties endured. It's kind of embarrassing and it's really sad. Mm-hmm. Can we talk about the transphobia in this? Oh, God. It's bad. It's rough. It's bad. The first book has it bad and then it gets worse in the second mm-hmm. book. Mm-hmm. There's a lot in the first book, this rhetoric that you can't trust strangers on the internet. And that you don't know who you're talking to and flirting with because it might be some guy living in his mom's basement who's 3,000 pounds or whatever. And, Mm -hmm. like, not only is that fatphobic, but that's also transphobic. That's really demeaning in a way that people can't. It's basically Ernest Cline saying people can't explore their gender identity. And I know, obviously, that there are people who are predators that pose as different groups of who people. catfish on the internet catfish yeah. on the internet, and then what sucks is that in this second and then of course that like mirrors h's story in a way because h is always saying that and yet h is the one who's catfishing wade in a way i mean mm-hmm. and wade's okay with it and they make a joke about it but at the end of the day in the second book there's a trans character mentioned and oh my. handled so bad oh my god there, it's handled yeah. so poorly there's a whole dialogue in the first book where Artemis and Wade go back and forth where Artemis is like, you don't know what I look like. Stop saying you love me. And Wade is like, you know, do you have a penis? And she's like, no. And he's like, did you ever have a penis? And she's like, oh my no. God, but that... it's oh. it's so gross and inappropriate. And it's like, okay, first of all, Ernest Klein, uh, it's very clear that you don't think trans women are women. Gross. And granted, yes, this was written in 2011. Views can change. But then the second book comes out and it's also awful. And the thing with H is like, I don't necessarily, I don't consider H's storyline to be transphobic or catfishy because there's an underlying element there that actually speaks to real experiences where a lot of times women who are playing games online have to hide the fact that they are women to avoid getting harassed. Mm -hmm. Like if someone's not on mic, it might be because they're a girl and they don't want to get death threats, rape threats, etc. I've Mm -hmm. played online before. I played online when I had a much higher voice. And buddy, it was not pleasant. No. It was not. It's not worth it. So like, if you're playing that game every day, why the fuck would you want to put up with that Mm -hmm. bullshit? And like, that's a much more interesting storyline. Credit to Ernest Cline for not writing it because he clearly understands that that's not his story to tell. But also, I think he would have done horribly with it. And then, like T said, there is a trans non-binary character in the second book. And it is so frustrating because, first of all, they describe her as being the non-binary sex, which, ooh, buddy. Ooh, buddy. They also are only ever there to, like, pop up, do whatever Wade wants, and then they go away again. Yeah. She holds no merit, really, except, like, she kind of just is a mole and retrieves shit for Wade. And what's even frustrating is that Klein decides to introduce her. And everything's fine and well, but then Wade has this moment of clarity where he's like, I shouldn't be doing this because Wade is about to look through her personal records to see who she is because he has a slight crush on her. And Mm -hmm. he discovers that she lives in a kind of shitty situation and then proceeds to look through her camera feed, notices that she kind of lives in a trailer, and then is like, hmm, I'm going to look through her school records even though she graduated high school. What's this? Designated male at birth but has been 
gendered as 16 uh, as female since 16 and then changed once she got an oni set and i'm like why do you need to say that literally you could just have looking like, at pre-transition school food it, yeah. it's so disgusting like you could literally just have her say trans rights on one of her fucking youtube videos and i would know like mm -hmm. why do you have to set up the situation where wade goes deeper and deeper into her past to find out shit that he has no business to know Mm -hmm. She doesn't ever put up that information to him. She is living, quote unquote, like stealth throughout her YouTube. Like he didn't have an inkling of this idea. And then Ernest Klein goes on to write. Her school records included a scan of her birth certificate, which revealed another surprise. She'd been DMAP, designated male at birth. Discovering this minor detail didn't send me spiraling into a sexual identity crisis the way it probably would have back when I was younger. Thanks to years of surfing on the Oni net, I now knew what it felt like to be all kinds of different people, having all different kinds of sex. I've experienced sex with women while being another woman, and sex with men as both women and a man. I'd done playback of several different flavors of straight and gay and non-binary sex just out of pure curiosity and i've come away with the same realization that most oni users came away with passion was passion and love was love regardless of who the participants involved were and what sort of body they were assigned at birth i'm gonna play a game with ernest klein and it's called the most dangerous game <laughs> the best is about ernest klein in Ready Player Two, there's this weird obsession with Kira being kind of portrayed as like the Yoko Ono of the group, which is so fucked up. Kira Maro does so much in the Oasis too. The more you learn about her throughout this book, you realize that even though she is just essentially a fucking player pawn in both of these books, you realize how much work she's done in the Oasis and how little she actually gets credit for it and that's like a huge issue already in the video game industry isn't it mm -hmm. and yeah oh absolutely it's just like why is ernest klein perpetuating this like if you're writing about a fantasy book also not to mention that this is set in 2045 to 2050 now at this point so it's like oh so your transphobia and your misogyny is still very much prevalent in society what have you done to step forward at all? Mm -hmm. Like, why are you still the same types of racist? Why are you still the same types of anti-Semitic? Why are you still, t like, why has the situation... Ernest Klein stinky. Ernest Klein is very stinky. Big stinky. And it's just so frustrating because, like, as someone whose gender is just bleh, but as someone who grew up gendered as female it's so frustrating to see this because how many times have i been in situations where men have been super shitty to me because i did not reach their vision of what they want a quote-unquote female gamer to be i've been yeah. like i my video game interests lie more towards in more niche and uh weirder rhythm games in particular especially like ps2 and i also really have a deep love and affection for ds games as a whole and i've been in video game stores where men have just been so fucking nasty to me because i'm asking about space channel 5 2 on the ps2 mm -hmm. as opposed to right you're seen as like some sort of interloper or yeah. invader and like immediately mm -hmm. ostracized and i go I... usually with a group of male friends as well and it's so frustrating because i'll see how the men who work in these stores ring up my friends and are nice and have a conversation and then i ask how much a fucking earthbound box is and i'm told it's too much it's more than you can mm -hmm. afford and i'm like what the fuck you don't know yeah. who i am you don't know my interests you don't know what i collect like fuck off and mm -hmm. the fact that klein continues to kind of keep this othering towards women within the series is so gross like, I think one of the things that actually bothered me the most is, like, the smallest detail, but in Ready Player One, while Wade gets all of these computer and haptic contracts because he's the first person to find the shard, Artemis releases a clothing line called Artemis, and Miss is spelled M-I-S-S. And I'm like, why doesn't she get a book deal? Why doesn't she get a documentary? Why doesn't she get a soda commercial? Why does she have to get a fucking clothing line? Like, what, mm -hmm. are you going to give her a goddamn tampon promotion too like yeah what the fuck and 
it's just so frustrating how these characters are continuously treated and I think I really deeply feel for the women and even H is kind of treated in this way that she still is hyper masculinized and it's very obvious that her wife is femme right because even after Wade finds out her actual real life gender he continues to gender her as a man yes which she never opposes but like it's also Mm -hmm. in the narrative in his head and at no point is he like hey how do you want me to refer to you yeah and h even goes on to change her name legally from helen to h which i think also then separates once again her being a woman in real life in ernest klein's mind to just continue for her to be this quote-unquote masculine male character and it's like how can you even justify this when she's a woman, clear as day? She's a lesbian. She's not a man light. She's a fucking lesbian woman. Mm-hmm. It's so, And, like, me as a lesbian, it's so fucking frustrating. Because, like, is that how my friends who are men view me as? Like, is that what my straight guy friends treat me as in their mind? Like... Yeah. Doesn't I feel like Ernest Klein has never fucking talked to a woman or a gay or a trans person in their in his goddamn life. But he has a wife and a daughter. I God. Run away. Leave now. No. Leave <laughs> Stop. Now. Ernest Klein might be a perfectly delightful person to talk with, mm-hmm. but the narrative of these books seems to uh convince me otherwise because Wade is so clearly an insert for himself and an mm-hmm. expression of his own ideas. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, Wade and the entire narrative is so exclusionary towards Mm -hmm. women and so so arrogant and condescending and patronizing towards them like in every possible instance and situation just to a a really really frustrating degree Mm -hmm. that just continually remind like it it literally felt like walking into the comic book store and being ignored Mm -hmm. that's what it felt like and there's like there's this idea right where it's like oh well you know nerd guys are just shy around girls they're not used to them hey that's not an excuse to be a dick and like Ernest Klein uses that as the pivotal like key point of the second book where it's like oh the fact that Halliday slash anorak you know was nervous around women is like it's, it's what made him a dick and like what made him not cool but doesn't actually seek to change that behavior in mm-hmm. wade mm-hmm. wade still does what he always had mm-hmm. planned to do where he makes a spaceship and he sends off the consciousness of himself his friends and a bunch of people who he didn't have the authorized consent of to copy their fucking consciousness it's so oh my god weird the ethical issues in this book <laughs> and like the lack of awareness that like Wade quite literally becomes Sorrento. He yes. he starts sniping people who speak badly about him in the game because people start calling him Penisville, Penisville. so he kills their avatar. <laughs> it's just, it's so childish. It's, it's so, so childish. And he never grows beyond that. No. He never does. And I think there's a moment when I was reading the book that I was like, oh my god, am I the bad guy? <laughs> no. Wade because, Watts is the bad guy. Because uh, Klein does this thing where he kind of forces you to believe that if you don't care about the 80s you're a bad person and sorrento who is the main baddie of the first book and then randomly shows up in the second book and just for the stupidest reason just dies like <laughs> for so no bad. consequence says at one point don't you kids ever get tired of picking through the wreckage of a past generation's nostalgia I mean, look around. The entire oasis is like one giant graveyard haunted by the undead pop culture icons of a bygone era. A crazy old man shrine to a bunch of pointless crap. And I was like, mood! Like, fuck this. I love- Sorrento, maybe you were right. (laughs) Yeah, like, I love media that comes out this year. Some of my favorite shit is from the early aughts. Some of my favorite shit is from this fucking year. Like, listen. James Holiday never mentions good old Paddington 2. Now, does he? If I could live in the world of Paddington. Oh, that would be delightful. Oh. Marmalade sandwiches. For- oh. If I could live in the world of Paper Mario. <gasps> wow! See, James Holiday never mentions Paper Mario. The, the, the most recent thing Ernest Klein writes about 
is, is Sword Art Online, Sword Art which Online. is literally the plot of the second book. He talks about Sword Art Online, and then he literally mentions later on, he's like, this is just like Sword Art Online. And I'm like, yeah, it's because you took the fucking plot. It's you took the plot of Sword Art Online. Quite That's literally the second Sword book. Art Online. It's The Matrix. It's Hackers. It's every other fucking bad 80s super science Book fiction. bad. Book bad. Book bad. It's book bad. And then I just... I can't believe, like, how do you not have the foresight to realize that you can't force somebody to love you? Like. But you can. Kira has. If, the- you, if you spew enough 80s knowledge at them, they'll yeah. fall back in love with you. And then wait you. 10 to 20 years, possibly. <laughs> like, you can't keep somebody hostage to care about you. That's abusive. Like, the end of the day, James Holiday is abusive. And I just. You can't and the th- Ernest Klein tries to couch it in him being on the spectrum, which has its own issues in and of yeah. itself. Like neither of us are on the spectrum. We mm-hmm. don't have the room to speak about that. But like that's a whole other facet of this is that the portrayal of Halliday is really gr- like on every level is really gross. Mm-hmm. It, it's just Halliday is the villain. Ernest Klein, not good writer, not good poet. Do not recommend a read. Like, it's not even, like, a fun bad read. It's genuinely, like, an uncomfortable... Just watch the movie, you know? Man, and the movie's not good. The, movie the movie's is not pretty good to look either. at, but the and movie's I feel also like bad. The movie's bad, too. But, like, if you had to touch one piece of it, at least you could it's see Tracer. It's also the shortest. It is the short. You can also see Tracer, which is kind of funny. Mm-hmm. The clues in the movie are so easy and so frustrating. Yeah, they changed, like, the the entire schematic of the game, really, mm-hmm. for the movie to, like, expedite it. And they also just can't show the mm-hmm. movie War Games, obviously. Yeah, and it's also <laughs> easier to digest 80s pop culture as well. Mm-hmm. Like... I will say, I did really enjoy the Shining sequence in the movie. That yeah, was cool. that was pretty Of, cool. like, seeing these very modern characters. I... I liked Parzival in the movie. Okay. I really liked his design. I was really charmed by it. And I was like, why do I like it so much? And then I was like, oh, he looks like Thanatos Hades. <laughs> He's got that e-boy TikTok hair. Oh my God. He got that Don Bluth haircut. Garfield and... ears, as my friend Cassie calls them. I love that. Uh, is there any part of this that you enjoyed, Cass, at all throughout this whole entire franchise? Okay. So I listened to the audiobooks, uh-huh. um, which was another facet of this. I told you this, but... Um, a lot of times when I know something is going to be maybe not the most uh, literary stimulating kind of read, I will listen to it instead because then my brain isn't going to try to restructure the sentences into mm-hmm. maybe what would sound better because that's the eternal editor in me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I decided to listen to it. And even listening to it, I spent a lot of time being really frustrated by the sentence structure because there are... Pretty much paragraph after paragraph is the exact same structure. It's the same simple sentences. It's a lot of, first I did this. And then, of course, I decided to do this. And while I was thinking about it, that reminded me of such and such media property. Now, such and such media property was this. And then, of course, I decided to do this. It's that over and over and over again. Um, But Will Wheaton is the one who read the audiobook, which added a whole other flavor of depth to this and it's it got really weird when like will wheaton had to say his own name and like will wheaton actually did a really good job reading and like perfectly carries the tone of obnoxious gamer that these books are written in um i never want to listen to will wheaton talk about uh grabbing his meat then though um but i like how will wheaton read the books to me and i liked when they ended (laughs) same um i also kind of like the pac-man scene i think pac-man scene was i think probably the best scene yeah it had like the because pac-man is so understandable to everyone really Uh and like that was a scene where ernest klein actually kind of described the environment really Mm -hmm. well so it actually felt like a proper scene in a book he had to stop because it was his own creation. And, like, that's the really frustrating thing. And I know we're going over time, but, like, there are little glimpses here and there where you see that, like, Ernest Klein is a capable writer who can describe situations really well, but he clearly doesn't have the confidence in himself. And the weird thing is that, like, we also talked about this prior, but, like, 
this book doesn't work as a book in concept, but would work better as a movie, but you couldn't make the movie because nobody's going to shell out that kind of capital for a first-time screenwriter, so you have to make the book first to prove that it can sell. But, like, the book doesn't work because you're like, this was exactly like that scene from Blade Runner, and it's like, in a movie, you can just show me the aesthetics mm-hmm. of Blade Runner, and immediately it'll click for me like they did with The Shining. Yeah. But in a book, you have to stop and try to describe it and fail because you're trying to capture a very visceral, distinct visual media that people might not be familiar with. I, bad. Okay. Not a good time. Don't recommend. So in this scene, Parzival is stu- uh, stumped about a clue about what to do next in the game. He ends up aimlessly wandering through a video game museum hoping to find the answers for something and then he ends up going deeper and deeper into the museum and stumbling into a recreation of a pizza joint where james holiday the creator of the oasis spent most of his childhood and he notices in the corner uh a pac-man machine that says beat the highest score and it is a very very high score and so Parzival continues just to play Pac-Man until he actually gets the perfect score that you could get in Pac-Man, which is really exciting and atmospheric. Like there's apparently a song called like Pac-Man Time or some Pac-Man Fever. <laughs> called pac-man fever um and it's kind of one of those situations where like you kind of get involved because there's a little bit of anticipation to see if he could do Mm -hmm. it because it's an incredibly hard thing to do and he's able to do it and then in return he just gets his quarter back and you're like what do i do with this quarter and obviously then the quarter is later on used as an extra life token and in the movie. Which is actually a really great payoff. Yes, which is fantastic and very useful and extremely helpful, too. And in the movie, instead of that scene happening, he just happens to get a trivia question right. And he's given a quarter. And that's his extra life, which is such a bland comparison to what you can do. And I get it, because it doesn't really move along the plot that much. It's not super action-filled, like... There's only a certain amount of time, but also the Ready Player One movie is like two hours long. Yeah. It's already long. I would have been I would have been happy to see the Pac-Man scene in. It's already long and the story moves at a breakneck pace. Yes. It is just like one thing right after the other. And which is because like because Ernest Klein spends so little time like describing stuff and instead just referencing things, like a lot happens in the book. And of course they have to expedite that. So they're trying to put in a lot of things and like there's just not a really good established series of stakes. Like at no point did I ever feel stressed or anxious in this book. Like yeah. the Pac-Man sequence was really probably one of the one moments where like I did feel any sort of anticipation or was like, oh, this is kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. There, I there was know. a scene in the second book that actually genuinely made me cry, but it was more due to my own emotional traumas Mm. more so than it is about wades and i actually stopped crying mid cry and i was like this isn't even that good i'm only crying because i have my own personal attachments to that issue Mm -hmm. and i think that really just shows how little i care for wade because you can literally send me a picture of something that like for instance if you send me a picture of a calico critter i will cry like, if I'm not mm-hmm. expecting it, I will cry because I just get so overwhelmed by how tiny, how tiny and small they are and how Put them in your mouth. baby-shaped they are. I love them so much. But I, I'm not going to cry over Ready Player One. Like, that's how little I cared about these characters. He, Klein does no legwork to make you care. He is truly only 
praying to God that you care by association of nostalgia. Mm -hmm. and I, the second book was pretty critically panned. It was. There was someone who described it as it could have been written by an AI. Damn. It would have been better if it were written by an AI, oh, which God. is scathing. <laughs> we roasted this. I know this is a little bit more of a uh, of a Lead book clubby episode, but you know, sometimes it's just fun to sit and talk about something and not stress ourselves out. Parasocial over... relationship was really heavy, so we need yeah. a little bit of a break. Sorry, mm -hmm. guys. Sorry, this is more discussion based. We did ask on the Twitter account if you feel how everybody felt about this franchise and if you don't follow us on twitter or you missed it we would love to hear your thoughts on this as well yeah Sin like sincerely i want to know how other people feel about this whether it's the movie or any of the books so i asked this question out listener of the show Ari maxwell which is becca Boart on Twitter said it's very it very much isn't my thing but every once in a while people I typically mesh with in fandom wise will tell me how much they're into it so I usually try not to bring it up unless I get asked directly I think it's just meant for people who approach fandom differently than I do and mm -hmm. I found that really interesting so I wanted to ask do you find yourself being more into a fandom as a solo thing or do you prefer to be in a big fandom circles because as a reader I enjoy finding other people who like the same things as me, but I struggle to find enjoyment when people's interactions with the series is only limited to memes. And the listener responds, Oh, 100% collaborative. I'm a fan and at the expense of canon sort of person. For me, the OG work is there to be entertaining and then left for the fandom to discuss and mine for new art. Precious way Ready Player One treats canon as if it needs to be kept stagnant to be valid just annoys me. And I thought that was such a wonderful point. Yeah, Like, that's such absolutely. a fantastic way to view it because that exactly is what Klein wants. Klein treats these moments as Bible, as biblical, as whatever you want to call it, um, as set in stone, you know? And even mm -hmm. Klein is like, you need to know about the 13 drafts about what Tolkien wrote for the whatever. Silmarillion. Yeah, and then you also got to know that John Hughes originally wanted Robert Downey Jr. as Ducky in Pretty in Pink. And I'm like, who knows that except you? <laughs> like, I feel there's Klein bases merit on knowledge instead of actual consumption and emotion attached to a series. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's because we exist in a space where we're readily available to fandom, while a lot of people like Klein weren't. I mean, they didn't really grow up on the internet, XYZ. So I feel like maybe there's some divide there, but I think that was an excellent point in the way that you don't need to care about something strictly for only what was given in canon. Mm -hmm. And then in turn, this is just literally just Ernest Klein souped up fan fiction. Mm-hmm. But it's not good fan fiction. No, it's awful fan fiction. It's very fiction. bad fan fiction. It's, fan. It's, it's not good. It's very boring. Anyway, if you would like to tell us your thoughts on Ready Player One, we would love to hear them. You can reach out to us on Twitter at AuthorsNotePod, or you can shoot us an email at AuthorsNotePod at gmail.com. If you don't want us to read or talk about what you said, you know, just let us know. Mm -hmm. But if you want to help support us and our hosting fees and help us make more great content... We would really love a donation to our Kofi. That's K-O-F-I at Authors Note Pod. We're Authors Note Pod over there too, just like everywhere else. If you like the show, give us a rate on iTunes or yeah. suggest the Apple show Podcast. to a friend. Yeah. If you have other friends who are also into fandom and also into this kind of criticism and stuff like that, if you have a friend who also fucking hates Ready Player One, send it to them we or if you have a friend who loves ready player one and you really just want to dunk on them yeah send them this episode yeah, I've <laughs> be nice though yeah be nice we weren't and... very nice to ernest klein but be nice to no. your friends and... and be nice to ernest klein <laughs> word of mouth helps us mm -hmm. way more than you realize so we thank you i we cannot thank you enough for how many people have listened to us i was mentioning it earlier we are getting over a hundred listens a week which is fantastic we're still mm -hmm. small, but we still obviously want to grow. So mm -hmm. we all got to work together to make that happen. You know, Cass, where can we just find like you? all the Gunters work together to take down the IOI 
We're barrier. all in this clan together. We're, we're all Gunters together. Let's clan up, Gunters. Um, <laughs> if you want to find more of me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media at Val Hethella. That's V A L H E T H E L L A. Tease, if we want to find more from you, where can we get you at? You could find me at Vicuna. That's V I C U N A D. Mostly I'm on Twitter. Our theme music was composed by James Wylo, and you could find him on Bandcamp under James Y. And our cover art was done by the wonderful Nyalius. You can find her shitposting on Twitter at Nyalius. That's N Y A L L I E S T. Until next time, uh, don't forget to log out of the Oasis, put your haptic gloves away. Uh, stay safe. Bye. Bye. Why the fuck was the print section 40 pages long? And why did Ernest Klein not mention pussy control once? I got a pocket full of quarters and I'm headed.